the case itself is just an incredibly interesting case. A case of a guy who was twice stripped of his American citizenship, the only person in American history to earn that distinction. He was tried once in Israel as the so-called Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka. This ended up being one of the most famous cases of mistaken identity, really in the annals of legal history. And of course the irony was that after Israel realizes that we got the wrong guy, this was not Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka, it turns out that he was Ivan the not so hot of Sobobor, Sobobor being another equally lethal um, Nazi death camp. So just kind of telling the narrative, I, I took a lot of pleasure in trying to uh, tell the story in a kind of gripping fashion, but in a fashion that was also attentive to all the kind of the bizarre twists and turns of the case. It's a very unusual experience sitting in on these really high profile international war crimes trials. Uh, they have their own very odd kind of rhythm to them. At the beginning, the courtroom is mobbed. The security is incredibly tight. Uh, it's pretty exciting. Uh, then at some point, as these trials drag on, uh, the courtroom starts to get a little more vacant. People start to disappear. And, you know, the fact of the matter is you have all these expectations for spectacle, and then it kind of collides with law's basic sobriety. Well, the biggest problem with what was going on in German courts is they basically treated um, state-sponsored genocide as if it were just a simple act of murder, just repeated like a million fold or six million fold. So they basically tried to use this ordinary statute of murder to pigeonhole this incredibly complicated history of state-sponsored crimes. The important holding of the court in Munich was that if you were a participant in genocide, then you were necessarily an accessory to murder. And it sounds like a pretty straightforward idea, but it actually took German courts 70 years to reach that understanding, and it really required a paradigm shift in their thinking to, to get to that point. And so I think you'll find this precedent hopefully having a kind of afterlife, not just in the couple of cases that it will make possible in Germany, but in the case law of some of the international courts. This is basically the end of the era of the Holocaust trials, of the Holocaust as being something that um, exists in the living memory of both uh, perpetrators and survivors. You're really reaching that, uh, that end point. So I think that makes it a very important moment and uh, kind of makes these cases both very poignant and significant.